A young man turns up on the church doorsteps after being missing for years, but instead of it being a joyous occasion, it's the beginning of a tale of abuse and allegations that are what nightmares are made out of. Today we're going to be talking about the case of Rudy Farias. Hello Sofa Squad and welcome back to the sofa. It's back there. As you'll see I turned a little blankie over so we can see Mr. Roscoe a little bit better. He is our mascot and my name is Paul. Now as you heard in the introduction today, y'all this case is recent as of this recording. Today is July 8th, 2023. This is a bizarre case that is unfolding every single day. More information comes out and the more information that does come out is completely bizarre. So what we're going to do today is we're going to be going over this case of the missing person. Uh, Rudy is the name that he goes by and whew, I mean it's a doozy. So be prepared because this case has a lot of like let's say trigger warning type stuff in it, uh, SA, uh, some very out there allegations. Now what I want to do is I want to do a very quick kind of overview, but we're also going to learn about this case as we watch the different uh, new segments and clips and interviews and stuff throughout the video and kind of let it speak to itself so it will unfold as we review it together. So let's go ahead and jump in. So Rudy Farias has allegedly gone missing as a teen eight years ago, March 6, 2015. But miraculously, he was found sleeping in front of a local church recently. He's now 25 years old. But the only thing is, is it doesn't seem he was actually ever missing. In fact, he was found with his mom's credit card, which she got two years prior, which she said he she which he said she gave to him so he could get her things. And here and is the issue is the mother. Now, we're going to start by looking at some stuff from her. So she even issued a statement soon after this took place. Let's take a look at it. So you'll see the little screen that I put up here. And I'm just going to read it out loud. Or if you're in a situation where you can pause to read, go for it. Uh, it says, we want to thank the media and public for all their support. My son, Rudy Farias IV, was found on Thursday, June 29th, after being missing for eight years. Currently, we do not have any additional information on Rudy's case. What we do know is at the time of his recovery, a good Samaritan located him unresponsive and immediately called police 911. My son Rudy is receiving the care he needs to overcome his trauma, but at this time he is nonverbal and not able to communicate with us. We are asking for privacy during this difficult time, but we'll share more details as Rudy continues to heal. Janie Santana. Okay. Now here's the theme we often see with these kind of cases like this. And let me just start this off by saying, y'all, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a cop. I'm not anything credentialed. These are literally just my opinions. Uh, and all of this is an allegation mode here. Charges have not been filed. No one's gone to trial. This is just for entertainment. I beg you to do your own research, come to your own conclusions, talk about it in the comment section below. But just know that this is all alleged here and literally just my opinion on this stuff so in these cases like this we see this now what how convenient is it to be like oh, he's he can't speak right now he's so traumatized but we will learn that mm, that's not true and things just kept getting stranger and stranger about this case now Ferris didn't want to be taken to the hospital and he would interview with police days later now he arrived with his mother and he wouldn't speak a word but then during this whole interaction and we'll hear more about it from the man himself uh, he asked to speak to one man away from his mother and that is when Rudy began to recount like these absolutely next level disgusting allegations of abuse at his mother's hands literally nightmare type stuff now what we're going to be doing is this is we're going to be watching clips we're going to be watching some clips of an interview uh with the community activist who's the gentleman who spoke with him and who is really going up to bat for him again you know for his for rudy's well-being and against the you know houston police department uh he's really taking a stance on this we're also going to hear from neighbors who say rudy was living with his mother the whole time and we're going to hear from family members who never bought this story finally we'll also hear from some private investigators who got roped into this case and were sent on a wild goose chase by the mother. Now, before we watch the clips, I want to take a quick look at an article that speaks of Rudy's loss in his life because he's experienced a lot of loss, a lot of trauma, even before this 
happened to him. For this first article you can see here, it says, Who was Rudy Farias's father? Missing 25-year-old's tragic family history revealed. And just very quickly, it says, Rudy, the Houston man who was reported missing in 2015, found last week, lost his father and a parent, uh, unaliving himself just months before his disappearance and years after his brother's sudden death. Now, it does go into his father, Rudolph Farias III, uh, and whose son, formerly named you know, Rudolph Rudy Farias IV, was found safe. Uh, and it says that his father worked in the Houston Police Department's Traffic Enforcement Division in 2014 when he took his life in his patrol car. The elder Farias took his own life on August 19th, 2014, just hours after he was relieved of duty for allegedly writing bogus traffic tickets to make overtime. Now, the interview we're getting ready to watch is with Quinnell X. Now, he met with Rudy, his mother, and investigators, and Quinnell was the one who ended up spending, like, I think, like, an hour and a half with Rudy or something like that and one detective talking. So, keep that in mind as we listen to this because we're going to watch two separate things, uh, like, let's call them press conferences with Quinnell in them um, and you're gonna hear this first one and then you're gonna hear the police department's response and you know not response to him but when they do their press conference and then what he has to say to that because all these you're just sitting here scratching your head like what who's telling the truth what's going on here it's all very murky um, so just keep that in mind and let's go ahead and watch that first clip I heard horrific things from that young man and I did not want him to see me start shedding tears, but I couldn't hold back the tears because of the things he was saying to us. And let's let that be a forewarning going forward. This is not for the faint of heart. Uh, so please be warned, like this video has an entire just, you know, trigger warning slapped all over it, okay? It is very sensitive. It is very, it's traumatizing to listen to. I mean, it's just like, oh my God, you know, what did this guy go through at the hands of his mother? So let's move on to the second clip. Now, Mr. Quinnell X will explain uh, during this interview that how basically we arrived here in the first place. And that is, you know, eight years ago, whatever, Rudy ran away. He came back like the next day, something like that. And his mother essentially was like, look, you're going to get in trouble because you ran away. You're going to get in trouble. You know, the cops are going to come arrest you. They have warrants out for this, so on and so forth. Now, what it would appear is that she used this as leverage to hide him away in the house to, you know, whatever it was that she allegedly did to him. This was like a form of leverage. Remember, he's like a teenager at this time, like 17, I believe. So there's that. Now, we're also going to hear allegations that, again, are coming from Quinnell X relaying the information uh, via Rudy telling him that, you know, narcotics were given to him, this type thing, hallucinogenics. So it's almost like, again, if this is true, that she allegedly was giving him you know, these substances and convincing him you're in trouble, you're in trouble. Now also remember this, and I'll bring this up as we watch the clips later, you're going to hear other people's stories kind of corroborate. Uh, I might be saying that word wrong, I apologize, but you're going to hear other people's stories, you know, all tied together and connect the dots with this. Okay, so with that being said, let's go to clip number two. And so we asked him, why did you run away? And he said he just got tired of her not respecting his boundaries. And she said that he wanted his own life. And his exact word was, I was tired of living like a slave. Now, this is just the beginning of the nightmare that he told this man. Okay, now also, I know I keep saying it, but the clips we're getting ready to get into are going to get deeper into what he meant by I'm tired of my boundaries being crossed, being treated like a slave. And the evidence will show him what I mean by evidence is allegations uh, from a few different people that it does seem like she was, you know, having him do her work and go to job and this like type thing. Um, so just keep that in mind and just be prepared for what we're about to listen to. She would take him to work with her and he would do the required work she was supposed to do. And a lot of the responsibilities of our job was on him. And he went on to say that what troubled him the most was her crossing his personal space boundaries. He said that she would make him sleep in the bed with her. And he said that she made him 
play daddy. The absolute horror of the things this guy was talking about sends shivers down my spine and seeing him trying to hold back his tears from what he's just witnessed and heard. I mean, you can tell this rocked his world, right? And I wanna give a shout out to him for being there for Rudy, creating the situation that Rudy was like, you know, I want you to stay. I want to talk to you. Because in this type case, that's what someone like Rudy, a victim, needs is that safe space, that safe person to begin to unravel the story. Because also, as we'll hear when we start connecting the dots ourselves with like what the cops heard and what wasn't done and why did this happen, it seems like this is his best advocate so far from what I can tell. Now, that being said, let's go ahead and move on to that next clip. He said that she, that he didn't like getting in the bed with her. That he would try to sneak out of the bed and sometime hide under the bed, but she told him he had to be her husband. This is absolutely disgusting. Think about what Rudy has had to endure. But also, as we're listening to this, just keep this in mind for what we're about to hear, like what happens at the end of this interview. And you're just like, what? Hello? Uh, like, is uh, are, are we on the same planet here? Because also what is interesting about this case, now again, it's all unfolding. This is all he said, she said type thing. And I'm not saying that in the context to be like, well, I don't believe Rudy because where I stand with it is I believe Rudy, right? I believe these things that this gentleman here is saying, uh, it, his emotions and all that type stuff. Now, if it comes out that it was, you know, whatever, then I will stand corrected at that time. Uh, but again, we just haven't had a full investigation yet for things to go through. And I would question how well that investigation would be done if we didn't have some outside resource like Mr. Uh, Quinnell X here, you know, you know, keeping a microscope on the situation. So keep that in mind uh, as we continue on. And now let's get further into uh, what Rudy had to say during this interview. A little, a little boy said she was the one providing drugs to him for years. Hallucin hallucination drugs, mushrooms, etc. And that the reason why he was left, he was just tired of her crossing his boundaries when he would shower. She would come and pull the shower curtain back and stare at him and then she would make him bathe her. This is literally enough to make you throw up, okay? Now, here's another thing, and I know I keep saying, keep this in mind, keep this in mind, I'll bring it back up as we watch it, but I want these little nuggets to kind of, you know, be simmering here. When we watch some interviews with some of the neighbors and whatnot, you're going to hear some of them mention that he would come over to the garage and he wouldn't be in, like, I think she said either a clear mind or a sober mind or something like that. And this is what I'm talking about, where while these are all allegations, you know, it hasn't had to stay in court, that type thing, you can start putting together the evidence of, okay, well, he's saying this took place. Then this person over here is saying this was their experience with A, B, and C. And you can start connecting the dots here and then pray that the police are doing the same. And she, I knew something was wrong with the story. When she was questioned, when he got, when, he went, when they found him, he had her credit card in his pocket. Now, this is just in one of the examples of how this case unravels, and it's just messy. Because a question at the center of it is, how did this go on for so long? I mean, that's my question. Like, they were good about, and when I say they, I shouldn't say that. I mean, she was good about lying about some things. Now, we will also hear evidence that, you know, he has had interactions with the police and whatnot. Now, Mr. X here, who will say, she had this boy convinced he was in trouble. She was pumping him full of drugs, and that's what I think happened. We've seen this time and time again. When victims are brainwashed by their abusers, they don't know any better, right? And so this has gone on for years. So I have no doubt that if she, he was instructed tell the police your name is this and you were born on this birthday. Okay. Like you're going to do, I get it. Right. Um, I mean, that's your, your mother at the end of the day, you don't really know any different. And throughout this, uh, and I'm not sure if I have the clip or not, but Mr. Quinnell X will say that he was like, I don't want mom going to prison. I don't want mom to go into prison. 
you know, and, and again, these classic signs, especially when it's dealing with a, a child and a parent as the abuser of this, you know, that's your world. You live in a world that your parents create for you. And sometimes that world is not a good one, but it's the world that you know, and it's, it's what you know. And to me, that's what I see with this. Now, again, like I said, my question remains, so much evidence has come forth with this, like the credit card in the pocket, and then this gentleman here saying, you know, well, he catches her in numerous lies, her being the mother. And we'll hear that in a secondary interview as well as this one as well. But for now, let's keep watching this. When she was in the room, he wouldn't say nothing. He wouldn't say one word when she was in the room. But the minute she left the room and we were allowed to talk to a young man, he asked. He said, can I speak with Mr. X by myself? Can I talk to one else by myself? And the detective was like, well, can one of us stay in the room? And he was like, okay, but, but I'll talk to him. Now, for me, this is the type of behavior that I would expect from someone who has been under the influence of their abuser, right? He's not going to say anything because she, he's used to her telling him what to say, most likely. Uh, that's often what we see in these cases. Now, to me, it was ballsy of him to be like, I'll talk to him, right? <clears throat> now, keep all this in mind because what we will find out here in just a couple of minutes is that when this is over with, he goes back home with her. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <clears throat> that part, I had to go. I was like, I have to research this a little bit more because I don't believe it. <laughs> I was like, I don't believe it. And we'll hear some of the dismay from Mr. X here in another one of his interviews because he speaks the way a lot of us would and probably are right now like yelling at the TV like, what, are you kidding me? Uh, so just keep that in mind. Another one of these little tidbits to keep back there as we watch this. And let's uh, continue to hear what took place to Rudy. I honestly believe, based on what he said to us, she was drugging the hell out this kid. And she convinced him that he was in trouble for initially running away and that law enforcement wanted to arrest him and put him in jail for running away. She had convinced him. Now, here's the thing. So if these allegations turn out to be true and it's like, yes, yeah, she's been pumping him full of drugs to keep him kind of brainwashed and in a fog and this type thing. Imagine, first of all, doing that to anybody, number one, right? Imagine doing this to your own flesh and blood, to your own child, to do something like this. Now, uh, obviously, the question is, why would she do this? And if it does turn out that these allegations are true, that she's convicted, whatever, um, you know, first of all, we'll hear some clips and... There's always money somewhere in these situations, right? There's always a motivation of that going on. Now, clearly, a human being, and I use that term lightly, uh, who would be willing to do this type of stuff to another human, especially their own child, uh, clearly there are other issues going on besides being greedy, right? I mean, this is not normal. This is absolutely monstrous. How did he stay missing for so long? I mean, eight years. He was allowed to... Um visit with some of the neighbors under an assumed name. She believed that after so many years, people had forgotten about the case and that under an assumed name and convinced him to use that name, nobody would put two and two together. Can you imagine being so brazen as to be like, oh, people will forget about it, especially when we learn how much others were involved, the community, private investigators, everyone but the police, right? And so that's where I also lie, where I'm like, well, but she did get away with it, right? It did work. You know, and she had this little system of, you know what, I'll say it's my nephew, I'll say it's my boyfriend. Uh, we'll give him a different name, we'll give him a different birth date. You know, because, I mean, at the end of the day, the person that you said is missing has lived with you for eight years. How do you even begin to get away with that? I was shocked that they have not done more. I was shocked that they had not executed a search warrant on the home. Now, in this one right here, we are also going to hear the police here in a couple of minutes when we watch their clips, and they will make mention of this, I believe, in reference to a question and whatnot that was asked, because some of what the police interview ends up being, or the police press conference, I should say, obviously, you know, they do their press conference, and then the reporters can ask questions, and they're almost like knocking down some of his allegations that he made. You know, like, oh, well, we did this, we did that. And while I do understand, like, I understand the law is the law, but it's so sad when 
you sit by and it's almost like you're watching something unfold and it's like, mm, you know, it's, it, it is what it is. You know, so too bad kind of a thing. And I feel like that's a hundred percent what went on here. But you know, the more that we find out about this and the more that we can find out like, okay, verify like, yes, this is true. I mean, you want to talk about dropping the ball. This is really bad. What big you... police failed in this situation. Oh, big time. No doubt about it. Absolutely they did. And see, that's what I'm talking about. And probably a lot of us are kind of feeling this like, uh, like, hello, what, what happened here? Now, as we get into further interviews with him and whatnot, you will begin to question like how, I, I mean, it, it doesn't make sense. There's so much unanswered with this still. Now, obviously it's brand new, right? We're just learning about this. And there is the gray zone of him being an adult, but I'm like, he went missing as a 17 year old, you know, and then literally came back the next day, but nothing was ever done to rectify that situation. And sadly, again, we'll also learn that there's really not much trouble you can get into for not doing that, right? Um, we will hear the police say, it's not a crime to go missing, you know, and I get that, but it, you know, also on the other hand of it, you know, I just feel like, you know, where is the, and I don't know if the word humanity is what I'm looking for, you know, because I understand where there's a part of this that's like, okay, look, this is the law, but you know, what do you do when you sit by and, and it's like you know an atrocity is going on? Because there was there was there were several instances where calls were made about him to law enforcement, and they did not properly follow up and follow through based on the history of that address. And yes, what he's talking about, we'll hear from other family members and whatnot, that yes, he did have several encounters with the police. Um, and the police were called by family members, but it would always like slip through the cracks or he would be hidden by then and that type thing. Because again, it's very bizarre to be like, in this type of situation of, there are numerous people saying that this is a lie and calling her out on it and getting police involved and still nothing happens. But what I can say, it ain't no way in hell that the woman shouldn't be locked up immediately. Aim damn in, okay? This is one thing that I like about him is he, spe he speaks the sofa language, okay? We're just real, we call it like we see it, okay? And I feel like Mr. X is this way too. Um, and, and, and again, I mean, listening to this, that's the outrage. Why isn't she locked up? And that's what's so bizarre because we get pivoted in the scenario of he said, she said type situation, but at the center of it is Rudy. He is the victim. And I too, like we've already heard echoed and we'll continue to hear, I fear for his safety. Is she aware of these that the son told you? Yes, yeah, she's aware. And then she goes back in there and tries to tell him, and she don't even know that was recorded. Tell him, tell him that you made it all up. That it was just a lie. You said she would, he, she would ask him to play daddy. Can you just, um... So you heard that, like, you know, there's other things, that allegations that he makes, such as this of, you know, she goes back in there, but she doesn't know it was recorded and she was telling him to say it was a lie, this, that, and the other. If this gentleman here has the recorded evidence that he says he does of this conversation and things like this, that he can bring out and put out there, it will blow the lid off of this. Based on what that young man said to me in front of the detective, I don't see why she's not in handcuffs right now. And again, amen. And this is what's so bizarre. So you hear him, the things that this young man said in front of me, in front of a detective, why isn't she arrested? And we're going to literally hear the detectives get up there and all say the complete opposite. And it pivots you to be like, who's, what is going on already in a confusing case? Now we have a community activist in the Houston Police Department butting heads on what took place in this conversation. And it's just making it even that much more confusing. And we know that Rudy and his mother left that hotel after interviewing with detectives earlier today. We have been here in their neighborhood all evening so far tonight. No sign of them. But we are expecting an update from Houston Police on this case tomorrow now this part right here i know i had to just literally but i was like pick my mouth up off the ground this part to me seems so dangerous it seems so baffling i have so many questions about it now again at the end of the day it's like he is a grown-up right 
But if the things that took place that this gentleman just said happen in front of a detective, oh, why? And it will bring up questions like this and we'll get even further into it where I'm like, so is this kind of relationship legal? I mean, I don't think it is. Not from what I've done in my little, you know, sidebar Google search, right? I mean, this is, you know, not supposed to happen, right? By nature or, you know, by law in most states. Uh, and so that part, I'm just like, okay, you know, what? Now, that being said, let's watch some news clips of interviews with family members, neighbors, people like this, you know, that have been interacting with this and that have personal experiences with him that can attest to, like, uh, this guy has been missing? Uh, no, he's been right there. That's right, Rudy. Neighbors tell me they saw Rudy and his mother here in their driveway at their home. They say the mother did not stay long, but she did appear to be worried about being arrested. From a distance, neighbors took video of Rudy Farias's mother loading up a car in her driveway Tuesday night. When he first went missing, he didn't, he didn't uh, report it to the police. And uh, they're trying to say that he might have done some crimes, which he didn't. And now they want to arrest me because they said I was hiding him. Her now, this part, again, is baffling. First of all, it's concerning that she's backing the car up, right? But then it's also concerning how much she freely talks to people about stuff that's so incriminating. You know, it doesn't add to her story. And I'm like, has she been doing this the whole time? You know, clearly we know she was making up fake names and whatnot. And she was directing him, allegedly, to do the same thing. And so that part right there, I'm like, okay, now notice when she said the thing about like, oh, he went missing, he didn't report it, you know, he said he did some crimes, but he didn't. She's kind of like trying to downplay that aspect a little bit. And it doesn't make sense. But remember when the activist said that she had convinced him that he was in trouble for running away? To me, it does sound like going kind of between the lines of, I, 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 I'm believing this. Think about someone who is twisted and imagine if they ran away and being like, oh, you're in trouble now. You know, the cops are going to come get you. But like somebody like really taking it to that next step of like, look, you're going to jail. We're going to have to hide you. We're going to have to put you somewhere to keep you hidden. Like this was like almost whether it was planned or not and executed that way or if he ran away and it was an opportunistic thing for her to be like, oh, wait a second, I, I can do the scheme. You know, this is what we can move on to next. You know, time will tell. And if this makes it to a situation of charges in court and it does go to like a trial and whatnot where like major evidence is brought out then for sure we'll learn more now let's get into some of those clips of neighbors and whatnot let's watch like a little montage of here of some interviews and highlights keisha ross lives down the street she knew rudy as dolph and saw him regularly he never came in my garage with a sober mind the neighbors also say she offered to pay them. Did it seem like she was offering money to get y'all to stay quiet? Stay quiet. She wanted us to keep quiet. But did you ever notice anything suspicious over there? No. Like, when he talked to us, he doesn't, like, say too much on who he really is. We just know that he lives down here with his mom. He goes to work with her like around 6 p.m. to and then later on that day I learned that he was supposed to be missing and when I looked at the thing my daughter pulled it up and it said he had been missing since 2015 I wasn't here in 2015 so I knew nothing about that because I watch the news every now and then I don't watch it like that so I never knew anything about that 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 day I discovered that he's supposed to be missing since 2015 I say how was he missing since 2015? And I met him in 2022. Right. I mean, this is like what most anybody would say, like, uh huh. You know, the neighbors had to all be like, what in God's name? Right. So a couple of things here. First of all, the young lady we just heard from, she's like, he never had a sober mind. Now, this is we'll learn. Like, remember, Mr. Quinnell X just said she was pumping him full of drugs. She was doing this. She was doing that, you know, giving him all this stuff. So then we have a neighbor saying, 
okay, well, he never had a sober mind when he was at my house. You know, then she's also saying, like, this whole insinuation from the mother of, like, trying to offer money to keep them quiet, you know, and the further into the clip, but I was just getting little bits and pieces out, she does say that she was like, look, I'm not going to be lying up in here for you, you know what I'm saying, which any, like, sane person obviously would say, uh, you know, but this whole thing about that, so then also when we hear it, I don't know if I have the clips of it, so I'll just say it now while I'm thinking of it, you know, but there's other things of, like, oh, other people in the neighborhood said that you know they haven't seen him for eight years well here you go now i'm not trying to say and, and you know i don't live there i don't know any of these people right but if we have one person saying mm, she's like trying to throw money and then some of the people in the neighborhood are like oh no he's been right there and then some people are like i haven't seen him for eight years i mean maybe she got to some people is what i'm trying to say but again i don't know that's just my opinion now also the young lady who was like well look you know Notice that all these people say the same thing. When he talks, he might be quiet, he might be shy, whatever, but he talks because the mother would have you think that he's nonverbal, right? And can't speak or anything. Or has panic attacks and this type of thing. Okay. Notice also the young lady said he goes to work with his mother. Okay, like six at night or whatever. Now, I am I believe she does some kind of security job. I could be wrong. If you know, drop it in the comment section. Now, there was another interview. I do not believe I have the clip of it here, but the gentleman, it's another neighbor, whatever, was basically like, yeah, when he was over here talking, hanging out, and he, like, this guy had a job, and he was like, hey, look, you want me to hook you up? And he was like, you know, uh, da uh, Rudy was like, uh, no, I'm good with my job. I make more money. I get paid under the table. So it's like, is the mom taking him to work and putting him to work and then, you know, breaking him off some, basically? Um, you know, it's all completely confusing. But again, you see where some of these little tidbits from the neighbors are matching up to the story that Quinnell X is saying, right? More so than the police, what the police have to say, which we're about a couple of clips away. What I want to do now real quick is listen to what some family members had to say. A woman identifying herself as Faria's aunt saying he's traumatized and quote, he doesn't want to see his mom. Also speaking to our Houston affiliate, KPRC. I fear for Rudy Faria's life. Everything's coming out to the light because I knew that she's been lying all this time. Rudy's aunt, Pauline Sanchez Rodriguez, tonight is... Now, like she said, everything will always come out to light eventually, and this is the very beginning of that. Now, you heard her, I'm scared for his life, and like her, many of us are, right? I've seen that echoed in the comment sections and whatnot. And it's your immediate gut feeling when you watch this, this very uneasy feeling. And we'll hear what Mr. X has to say here in a little bit when he talks about like, look, in normal cases, like stuff like this, like the abuser's not allowed to speak to, you know, the person and whatnot. Why is this being treated differently? Why are the cops acting like this that, and the other? And we're getting ready. I think we're like a clip away. Maybe it's the next clip that we're going to watch. Um, why did this go this way? Now, I also question, because as we get deeper into this, and again, at the time, speaking of the time of this recording, which again, it's July 8th, it's the weekend. Um, so this could be different depending on when you've watched this, when you are watching it, you know, but my next question would be, well, could he go with the aunt? Could he go with this other person? You know, now I get, from what I understand, he allegedly has gone willingly back with the mother at this point in time. So that part's very confusing to me. Not that he's gone willingly back, because I think oftentimes in these situations, it's what you see, it's what they know. Um, and so I can grasp that part, even though it's not what I would want for him. Um, but that part is very confusing to me. And also it's very confusing is how these family members, how she was able to hide him away for that long, you know, and away from some of these family members. But you'll hear from other family members or of other family members who are like, oh, no, he comes by and checks on me. And in fact, let's go ahead and watch that clip now. It's just we've always in our hearts knew that he wasn't really missing. During those eight years, his cousin Cassandra Lopez says she called 911 in 2018 after family members saw Farias at his mother's home. She says their grandmother told her she spoke with Rudy often. And how did those conversations go when she would talk about Rudy? She would just say, I, I saw Rudy, you know, he came to check on me and no, I... Okay, that's what I'm talking about. So it's like, okay, here the grandmother's like, oh, he would come to check on me, and, you know, I saw him, and, you know, this, that, and the other. And this is where we would hear one account of 
one account of the police being called saying, hey, he was seen you know, here at the home. And again, there's always a story, oh, it was the nephew, oh, it was this, oh, it was that. Now, I'm sure the mother, Rudy's mother, made sure to dodge certain people, right? And other people she seemed to be fine with. But again, that's what's so confusing about it is that she was able to keep a charade up like this in broad daylight under everybody's noses for so long. Now, let's go ahead and move on to that press conference that the police gave. And again, I mean, I'm sitting here scratching my head over it. When I watched it, I was like, Are, what? So we'll be revisiting some of this information we've already looked at to compare notes to what the police are saying as we go through it. Rudy was recently identified as having previous HPD interactions, meaning that he made contact with, with patrol officers on, out on the street. However, during these contacts, Fictitious names and date of births were given, misleading the officers, and Rudy would remain missing. Now, I just wanted to put this up there so that we can hear it from you know, the horse's mouth type thing of, okay, yes, you know, he had interactions, he gave fake names, he gave this and that. Now, again, this does not make me sit here and think, oh, well, you know, he was part of the scheme or, you know, anything like that at all, right? I believe that he was a victim and I believe that this is just, it's how this goes, right? I know it's very tricky, but it's just how it goes. So let's go ahead and move on to the next clip. After investigators talked with him yesterday, it was discovered that Rudy returned home the following day on March 8th. 2015. Now, again, this is in reference to the original, you know, going away, running away, where yes, he ran away, he came home, and then you pick up the mother's side of the story, and then allegedly via, you know, Mr. Uh, Quinnell X, that Rudy is like, oh, well, she convinced me that I was in trouble, and this, that, and the other, and then you piece together the mother saying what she said earlier about, you know, oh, he went away, you know, oh, they said he did crimes, but he didn't, you know, didn't report it, the whole nine yards, let's continue. The mother, Janie, continued to deceive police by remaining adamant that Rudy was still missing. She alleged her nephew was the person friends and family were seeing coming and going. However, we disputed that. Now, at the end of this, we'll hear what she could face for doing that. And y'all, it's literally a joke, okay? But also, we're going to hear from private investigators who worked with this whole, you know, the missing thing. Because she ran with this, right? I mean, this is like a thing. It's giving Sherry Papini, okay? Like, literally, if you follow that case, if you know what I'm talking about, then you'll know. It's literally so similar to this. I am not saying that in the context that I think he was making himself go missing. Or, you know, he was, like, helping out with it. Because, again, I'm like, he was a kid, right? Um. I don't think that he was part of that or that he was forced to be part of it is what I should say. Um, so, yeah, let's keep going on. Currently, the DA has declined any charges at this time for making fictitious reports and failure to ID. Uh, investigators have reached out to Adult Protective Services. HPD Victim Services has reached out. We've also connected Rudy with victim services to ensure that he has a method to recover. Now this is the part that had me going, what? They have not done any kind of charges and we'll keep going with this, like no charges at all, right? Even for the basic stuff. But what we would learn here in a minute that we'll find out is that, I mean, if they charged her with this kind of stuff, it really is absolutely nothing. Now when he says like, oh, we've gotten him hooked up with, you know, victim services, this, that, and the other. I mean, my first thought is great, awesome. Okay, kind of, this is definitely a good step. But this is a woman who was able to keep the charade going forever. I mean, do I think that she could pull this off or some kind of like adult protective services? Absolutely. She can spin this however she wants to. She's clearly done it and gone away with it for years. Now, based on Rudy's interview, there were no reports of sexual abuse reported. Um, if there is a disclosure made, we will continue to investigate. Currently, the investigation is active and there are new leads coming in. We'll continue to follow those leads. Again. Pick my mouth up off the floor. This is where I was like, okay, I don't know who to believe now. I was like, well, was, you know, Quinnell embellishing this or making this up? You know, or what's up? And we'll hear his response to this here in a minute. And I went right back to being like, no, I think this is what went on. And I'm with Quinnell. Why? Why isn't she in handcuffs? Why wasn't that done? What is going on? What lies beneath the surface with all of this? 
Now, what we're going to do is we're going to listen to reporters ask the detectives, the chief, some questions. Now, I'm going to say this. If you're watching this with your earbuds in, then you're going to have to really pay attention to it. But what I'm going to do is basically paraphrase the questions because it's so low you can't really hear them. And then we'll listen to the responses that whomever is giving the response. Uh, and we'll talk about that here for a second. Now, the first question that's being asked is in relation to those SA allegations as well as him being drugged by his mother. And then the reporter just goes right in for it. And it's like, are you saying that, you know, Quinnell was lying? And so now let's hear what the chief response to this is. Yesterday yeah. we heard from activist Quinnell X and he made some shocking allegations that he was I'm in the room with a detective and he heard from Rudy firsthand he said that there were sexual abuse allegations and that he was drugged by his mother. From what you just said today, are you saying that the activist was lying? Basically what we're saying is our investigation is our investigation and we treat it the same. Uh, we're going to um, our investigators were, were in the room, and basically, you know, uh, what, what they heard and what they interviewed, that's what we attest to in our offense reports and our investigations. And I'm not here, neither are they here, to question anybody's integrity. But our integrity with the Houston Police Department stands, and, and, and uh, we're going to report and put in offense reports what a victim or a potential victim tells us. Okay. I mean, he shut that down real quick, right? And notice in the beginning right that where they started asking the question, you saw him go, I'll answer this. Like He was like, get out of my way, I'm going to handle this one. Now, when I was listening to this originally and whatnot, I began being like, okay, what's, I, I don't like this, is, I'm very confused. So part of me was like going down these two avenues. I'm like, okay, are they being tight-lipped on this? Which again, I get if they if cops have to like keep stuff close to them so that it doesn't mess an investigation of all that type of stuff. I get it, right? We will learn it eventually. But there's something that feels different about this case in that way. And so I was like, well, are they doing this? So they don't scare her off. We already saw a video of her with a car and all that kind of stuff. So I'm like, well, are they trying to get some charges together and they don't want her to run off or do anything else? And so that's why they're saying these things to throw her off, basically. Like, so I'm like, okay, I can get down with that right but he's still in her care you know what i'm saying so that part I, it literally has me baffled now in the next clip we're getting ready to watch the reporter reiterates asking you know if nothing about sa was reported so let's again listen to the investigator's response about this they go into a little bit more about it just to be clear in that room the detective did not hear anything about sexual abuse go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Sergeant Stephan Menez. Uh, yes, I, I interviewed him, and no, uh, there was no. You know, I'm trained to 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 listen for probable cause. I'm trained to listen for uh, statements that can help me get charges or or move for, for, forward with the case. And no, I there was no statements made. Uh, during this investigation so far no thank you next question go ahead maria now this is the part that i was like what again i say what throughout this whole damn video because it literally has me baffled this was so confusing to me because i'm like but we just heard quinnell say this now again you have to play devil's advocate up here of like well was he being embellishing you're like where did this come from you know like what took place and again he wasn't telling us everything because it, it I mean he was disturbed by some of the stuff that Rudy said so he was like I'm keeping this like you know I'm not gonna put that out there like that type situation right um you know not my place type thing but you can put two and two together and figure out what was taking place between the mother and the son on some of this stuff and again that's where I'm just like well okay why wouldn't there be any charges for that even if it was like no as a willing thing I mean that's illegal right and so this part just has me baffled and again it clearly has Quinnell baffled too because when we hear back from him again in a minute after he apparently heard this you're gonna hear his outrage over it the, the investigation is still going on, uh, Courtney, and um, I'm not going to say that he's a victim or not. I, I'm thinking, you know, and, and, and saying we're going to treat this just as we do with any uh, potential victim or victim, and, and we're going to give uh, respect um, to everybody that's that's involved, and we're going to conduct our investigation. And uh, we're, we're kind of right at the beginning of it. Uh, this investigation is going to go on after this uh, press conference. Now, while he is correct, this investigation is in its infancy, uh, but I still have lots of questions. Now, one thing I wanted you to take note with this clip that we just watched is when he says, I'm not going to call him a victim yet or whatever. 
Very interesting choice of words. And again, I understand where an investigation needs to take place, but what has me baffled with this, and amongst other things, and we'll hear from Quinnell again when he says this, is, you know, why why are we treating what is seemingly, you know, let's just call it a domestic violence situation, right? Uh, but it's so much deeper than that, right? Um, but that's not how it goes down usually. Why is this being treated differently? I have the same question. We don't have any information to, to say that there was any kind of kidnapping or anything like that right now. Okay. Have any search warrants been served at the house? I don't think there's been no search warrants. But no, at the yeah. time he was reported missing eight years ago, being missing is not a crime. So the, the detectives had no lawful means or probable cause to issue a search warrant for the residence, which was searched several times. Now, again, remember that whole comment about the search warrants earlier in the clips that we watched, and now you hear the reporters. Obviously, they're going to be latching on the stuff that they heard from Quinnell uh, and, and questioning this. And you hear the cops like, oh, it's not a crime to be missing, you know, but one would think the way he worded this is she let them search the house. You know, now he doesn't say that. Those are my words, but he's like, but the house was searched several times. Okay, well clearly when he they whatever would take place is she was hiding him somewhere and whatnot right now i guess my next question is well wasn't his stuff around like to the point that you could tell it was like being lived in you know it, it doesn't make sense again it just seems like this whole scenario was almost like people going over there and checking off a box yep okay we went and by and did our little due diligence now let's beat it you know type thing it's very, very confusing as to how this went on for so long. That was in March 7th of 2015. So there was a missing persons report that was filed. Correct. And so this is what I'm asking on this. Could the mother be detained for filing a missing persons report and never once informing HPD that he came home? Yes, she could be reported. Uh, or detained, that offense is a Class C misdemeanor, which is similar to uh, a traffic citation. Right. Go ahead. Now, the part that they were being asked was, you know, these charges of not reporting or, you know, failure to say, like, hey, he's back home, whatever, like this lying type thing. And you hear that it's like a traffic citation, which I'm just like, really? I mean, it's so weird in this true crime that we watch, like some of the things we learn where I'm like, you can do that or you know that's not like you get it like that's major to me right like that's major and it's like you just get you know that okay well oh, all right well let's keep going then and on that note let's turn our attention back to mr quinnell x during another conference interview that he gave after this right when he's basically responding to a lot of the things that were said in it and we're going to start off with a montage of some highlights of it it really captures the moment and i think what we are all probably thinking and feeling absolute liars oh, man. that man heard everything that i heard these are blessed waters from my mom i'm standing here speaking the truth of what Rudy said to me. And I'm standing here fighting for that young man. I cannot believe and I refuse to believe that there's not a single charge that they can come up with to put this woman in jail so a judge can tell her you can have no contact with the victim just like you do in domestic violence cases. When the question was asked, was there a sexual relationship? The sergeant lied in his response. And then the next question was, was there a sexual relation between the mother and her son? They refused to answer that question and said he's a victim and we protect all sexual assault victims. See, they know what I'm saying is the truth. Mm -hmm. That dirty, low-down damn cop was right there with me. Why, did you, why didn't you say, well, from what we know, there was no sexual relationship? You so freely saying that there was no sexual abuse reported. So what are you suggesting? Because he was of age, he gave consent. Is that what you're trying to suggest? For that cop to hear about all the drug abuse, and he ain't do nothing to get that boy no help, that woman should be under the jail. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you for a fact what this young man said to me, and I'm going to leave it at this. HPD, don't try me. 
because I got it on record what he said to me. Woo! I mean, he swept the floor with some truth right there. Now, I, I mean, I feel the same way. Right? And you're just like, listening to this, it's like, okay, he's doubling down. These are major allegations for this gentleman to say against the police department, right? Of They were there. They heard this. This isn't a lie. They heard the same stuff I did. Why isn't she arrested? You know, and, and at minimum, he heard the drug abuse. Why wasn't any help trying to be given to him? This is where there's something very fishy going on here. Something very, very fishy and not right and i'm not saying that really it really honestly it's with the investigation that i feel like something is not making sense about this at all i too have so many questions like this why wouldn't it go further now again it sounds like they're checking things out well we got adult protective services involved okay great but i mean she's swindled numerous people into the story for years so i don't know how much help that's gonna be we begged I begged the detective, don't allow Rudy to go home with this woman. Don't allow Rudy to leave with this woman. I begged them to do something to stop him. I said to the detective, all three of them, after what you and I just heard in that room with that young man, how in the hell can you allow that boy to leave with that woman? If a man gets arrested for putting his hands on a wife, God forbid, they tell him that you cannot have any contact with the victim. Rudy is a victim. Exactly. He's a victim in this. I don't understand why not more is being done now. It's like the cops, like, oh, he willingly, you know, he wanted to go back and... You know, I, again, I just don't know how this part works. You know, but again, we see it so often times where, say, just like the gentleman here just said, you know, like in a domestic violent type situation, say the person, oftentimes it will be the female, will be like, okay, you know, I don't want to press charges, whatever, and then it escalates, and then it keeps going because they're so tangled up in their abusers nasty little web that they have them in and that's what I feel like is going on here with this gentleman with Rudy um, he if these allegations about the drugs and all this types of retreat I mean he's lived in a foggy world he doesn't know you know like right from wrong right it's like he only is knows what his mother is trained to do if that's what ends up coming out to be true and so again it is heartbreaking to learn that it's like after all this he's just going back why couldn't he go with another family member? You know, why couldn't he get that part? I don't understand that part unless he himself was like, no, I'm going to go home. But, you know, that's the other part where I'm just like, but are you allowed to of this kind of, you know, if you're saying these allegations, I mean, and then you just turn right around and say, I'm going to go back home. Yeah, you know, I mean, do they have to let you or they can intervene? I mean, again, I don't know, but I pray it does not end in him truly disappearing. And the detective said to me, because he is an adult, there's not a lot we can do about it. And again, I get that, right? And this is kind of what I've been alluding to the whole time where it's almost like, well, they're an adult, so they can go do what they want to. And maybe that is the law, right? Maybe that is what the law is. Like, look, I mean, it is what it is. But that's where I'm just like, well, if somebody confesses to, like, let's say this, like, very inappropriate relationship between, you know, a blood relative and them, I mean, can you then just turn around and be like, okay, well, you, that's legal, you can go back home, or are they trying to avoid having to charge him with something, too? These are the murky questions that I just don't understand, because I don't, I don't understand the law enough. Obviously, I never claimed to be a lawyer or anything. How someone could confess to this kind of stuff, uh, the hands of their abuser, but then the cops not really do anything about it. You know, that part seems very off to me. But now again, remember, you know, another question I ask, and again, this is speculation street. This is not true. This is literally, I have no other reason than just my own little, you know, mind that starts to wonder. You know, his father worked for the Houston Police Department. So is there some history there? Is there some type thing there? of, uh, you know, like, it, so the dad got caught doing this whole traffic ticket violation. There's like four other people where they got let go and whatnot. So is there some kind of bias already there because of that history? I mean, I don't know, but I have to ask at this point. She lied and told me when I first talked to her that the Hispanic young man that was seen here was her ex-boyfriend. And then when we were in the meeting with the detectives, 
She said it was her nephew. She'd been telling lies for years. If it wasn't for Grizzly, that mother never would have called me. But she called me thinking I was going to help cover up with the lies she would tell and defend her. And that's the thing, as we'll hear in a minute, where she pulled lots of people into this whole scheme. So it makes sense to me, you know, this gentleman's known for kind of being like a community activist, going up to bat for people, that type thing. So she was probably like, I'll leverage him. I'll pivot myself to be this victim of the cops, this, but, 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 but whatever it was, right? But then it backfired in her face where it's just like, uh, girl, yeah, probably not the person you should have called, right? Because he's now calling you out. Let me tell you something. Rudy is a victim. And for HPD to suggest on any level that that young boy may be involved in this scheme, that's wrong. Now, I'm glad he brought this up because remember the part we just watched during the press conference where they were like reluctant to say he was a victim? Now, I don't know if there's also other, you know, things that have been said in addition to that, but that was the first thing that came to my mind when I watched that is I was like, well, they're not going to say he's a victim. I'm like, well, what are they trying to say? You know, <laughs> like that he's a willing participant in this? You know, I don't think so, but again, I don't know any of these people, but I mean, the, the stuff that he's coming out and saying, and not just the stuff that he's saying, but the context of it, not speaking in front of the mother, you know, uh, telling neighbors about how, you know, he turns the phone off, doesn't, his mother bugs him, doesn't want to be a slave, doesn't like his boundaries being crossed, only wants to speak to Mr. Quinnell alone, this type thing. I mean, this is all in line with people who have lived through this kind of abuse and whatnot, like it's familiar. And so that's where I'm just like, uh, yeah, you know, I, to sit here and whether it's an, insin an intentional insinuation or not of, you know, he might not be a victim, he might be in on this scheme. He's a kid or he was a kid, you know, like at the beginning of this. And again, it's just like, you also have to look at what, I mean, what does she do to him for the first 17 years of his life, right? I mean, this is just speaking of at the age of 17, up, he ran away, whatever. There's a reason he did. And I can almost 100% tell you a why after hearing the stuff that we've heard. That boy wasn't involved in no scheme. That woman a straight up monster. Amen. Telling you straight up. That's what that woman is. Aim damn man. I mean, okay. This is, I just, again, he's got to spot the damn sofa if he wants it, y'all. Because, I mean, that's what you're listening to this, and it's like, I mean, that's just what it comes down to. She's, you know, a damn monster. These are his words. And these are strong things to come out here and say. I mean, he, again, for me, watching this, if this is like trial of public opinion, you know, or court, or however you call it, and just simply based on emotion, all this type of stuff, I'm like, I mean, I believe this man, right? I mean, he has the same outrage as I think a lot of his experience. When we heard this and it's like, what? You know, she made him do a what at nighttime? I mean, you're just like, this is horrible. This is horrifying. But it also just seems like it, he was failed at every step of the way, which is so heartbroken. You know, and then just be like, oh, he's an adult. Sorry, he's an adult. You know, it just is like, but we, we just can't leave someone behind like that. I'll take your questions. Why do you think HPD is lying? I think HPD is embarrassed that they encountered Rudy on several occasions and did not do their due diligence. And hearing you might have some of what's really going on. Imagine how embarrassing that is for a police department to be like, oh, this person who was missing for eight years was still living at home. You, the home you've been to in search numerous times. The home that people call the police on numerous times. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not a cute look. I mean, it's a blemish. But what would upset me if this is the case is that then it's like, a, okay, well, let's try and pivot this around and, you know, deflect, deflect, deflect instead of, oh my God, this is, you know, we messed up. Let's, let's help this person. You know, let's make it right now. You know what I'm saying? That's how I feel this should go. And again, if this comes out that this is true, this is, you know, what happened, then let's not keep failing him. Let's help Rudy. So you mean to tell me, Houston Police Department, this woman can tell multiple lies to law enforcement. 
She can raise money all on GoFundMe pages. I talked with the investigator for at length today who worked on this case for years, the private investigator. She would raise money for Miss Jenny. And one time she said when she raised the money for her, she only came for five minutes, picked up the $2,000 and drove off and left and didn't even thank the people who was raising the money on behalf of Rudy to look for him. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Remember how his aunt said earlier that everything always comes out to lie? Well, this is what's happening right now. And all these people that have been involved in this that have been like, mm, something's not, uh, this is no. That right there that he just said, follow the money. It's the root of all damn evil. I tell you what. I mean, it's so sad, but so true. Now, on that note, let's let this be a segue into the next and the last section of this, which is listening to some of those private investigators. They're on News Nation now, as well as other outlets, I believe. And first, we're going to look at a tweet by Brian Enton of News Nation now. If you don't follow him, make sure to follow him. Uh, excellent reporter, and uh, he's just overall great. I follow him for a lot of different different cases, but let's read this and talk about it. So here on the screen it says, a private investigator says Rudy Ferris' mother recruited him, had him come to fundraiser to raise money to find Rudy. He says she seemed not sad, showed up late, then sent him on a wild goose chase in Mexico looking for Rudy. Private investigator will be with me on uh, 10 p.m. at News Nation. Now, I, with this, I was like, oh my God, are you crazy? I mean, it just gets deeper and deeper, right? So let's watch one quick clip from that and talk about it. So what led you to Mexico? Well, Janie had said that a lady had called her from a number in Mexico, and she said that the lady was holding Rudy captive. So uh, I, I do a lot of work in Mexico. I'm kind of known as the private investigator in the industry that does the work in Mexico. And uh, so I contacted some some friends of mine that were in the Policia Federal, the federal police in Mexico, and I had them trace the number to the landline. And then I had them do a welfare check at the residence. And of course, Rudy was not there. And then I contacted the lady myself and, and uh, she told me that she had already told Rudy's mother that she didn't want to be involved in the scam that Rudy's mother was trying to pull off. Again, we'll refer back to the end. Everything always comes out into the light. Yeah. First of all, again, ballsy to get private investigators involved. Seriously, while you're hiding him out somewhere. Real ballsy, okay? But then to have people just turn around like, I don't want to get involved. Now, remember the neighbor who was like, like she got this feeling she was trying to give us money and this kind of thing. Well, here you go. You know, again... If all these allegations turn out to be true, we have this gentleman saying, oh, yeah, we finally traced the thing down to Mexico and, you know, went down there or talked to the woman at least. And, you know, she didn't want to get involved in this scam. The word scam keeps coming up with this whole situation, right? And this is in reference to the mother, not to Rudy. Now, also, notice that he says the thing about the uh, fundraiser of, oh, yeah, you know what? Uh, went to it. She wasn't sad you know, uh, shows up late. So uh, again, these common themes. Now let's watch a little montage of another in private investigator. Yes, multiple ones who were working, uh, who she was working on this and let's hear what she has to say. There's a lot of people who put their heart and their soul and their time and their efforts into getting answers when I feel like we've been duped by her the whole time. Yes. Some of those resources we have to pay out of our own pockets for. So, you know, as volunteers, we're willing to do that for families of the missing. And that, that's part of the heartbreak in all this is that so many resources were just misused. I'm lost with this one as to whether, you know, somebody's got it hidden somewhere or whether he just, um, or whether maybe his mom was involved. So the last clip, if you weren't able to hear it, she's saying, you know, about, well, maybe he's hiding somewhere uh, or maybe mom was involved or something like that. And again, you heard her also say, you know, it's tragic because so many resources were wasted and I, you know, not really so much wasted as much as it was like misused, right? Because clearly this, you know, this mother was pulling the wool over in everybody's eyes and utilizing lots of resources. Imagine the slap in the face that it, this is for people who have children who have gone missing who that parent has not been able to sleep a wink for 
years and years wondering what happened to their child and then you hear about stuff like this of not only are they scheming the you know the system or whatever but abusing said child along the way right this seems so familiar and i cannot think of the name of it right this second the gypsy rose case uh, of that it has these elements of that you know of the the parent and uh utilizing the child for like this attention but also for money right you heard the other investigator talking or you know saying uh, in the tweet that we read about you know oh they sw swung by got the two grand ran in and out kind of a thing you know again follow the money so here's the thing this case has just popped off this has just happened this just took place he's on the church doorstep footstep or whatever and you know clearly discombobulated and this has peeled back the layer on this well right from the get-go the mother starts trying to lie about this and she's continued to lie but it's also peeled a layer off of is this whole dynamic between the houston police department and mr quinnell x of i heard this information they heard this information what's going on dudes you know now again i'm all for letting cops to take their time and do an investigation and gather intel on that type thing but something doesn't feel right here something something feels very wrong uh and clearly one thing that feels very wrong is the fact that he's with his ab alleged abuser um that part really weighs on me and i'm very nervous for him i hope that they're being watched by somebody to make sure that she doesn't try and up and run and hide him again somewhere because really i don't know how she could back her way out of this it would be one thing if rudy showed up and had this crazy story but literally everybody else is like um no both of them them were really in on this or they had this like energy like that but literally that is not the case literally everybody is like yeah didn't believe the mother you know there's definitely shady vibes with the mother and something just seems maybe not you know not wrong or but something something's wrong right but something's off with rudy now i don't know if we're dealing with somebody who might have other issues going on besides all this and it did before um i haven't been able to find too much information like well what was he like as a child that type thing but i think there was some level of normalcy here now clearly the trauma i mean he lost a brother he lost a father to pretty extreme circumstances and then again whatever torment his mother put them through you know leading up to to these events and then clearly with these events this is insane if he's been pumped full of drugs for years and years his poor little mind is going to take forever to unravel that and be deprogrammed really you know and to get back on the normal level of like this is life this is normal this is right and wrong and a place of safety of you don't have to be with your abuser. You don't have to be with her. You can get away from this. And hopefully that's what will happen if all of this ends up coming out to the light that yes, unfortunately this young man has been subjected to absolutely nightmarish events at the hands of his mother. So that being said, obviously we're gonna be following this drop it in the I want to know what your opinions are what do you think um, you know what do you think of what Quinnell had to say what do you think of the no charges of the variations between what the police department's saying and the back and forth between the the you know the community activists and the police department um that part has me very curious so anyways um if you are still watching i appreciate it mr roscoe says thank you he says drop him some sofas pretty please so he can go sleep on them uh and that's it and until we meet down in the comment section to continue the conversation whoosh, i'll see y'all there